When we were studying John recently, we noted that John was writing his gospel to a Greek mind and to a Greek culture. Matthew was completely different. Matthew, of course, was uh, quite an unusual man, a brilliant man. His book has been called, the book of Matthew, the most widely read book ever in any kind of literature. And when he was writing, he was writing primarily to a Jewish mind. Therefore, the approach had to be entirely different. As a matter of fact, when Matthew was uh, writing, uh, he produced this wonderful, what we call gospel, and then it was given first place, as we know, in the New Testament. Now, that's not because it was written first, because it wasn't. It was put there first because it was the natural, as it were, bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. After the end of Malachi, God had been silent for 400 years until the opening of the book of Matthew. So we had left behind all the prophecies regarding the Messiah in the Old Testament, and Matthew then starts to talk about their fulfillment in Christ. Therefore, there is a natural flow, even allowing for the 400 years between Malachi, the end of Malachi, and the beginning of Matthew, because the Old Testament, as I said, talked about the prophetic word of the coming Messiah, and Matthew then goes ahead and confirms the Messiah has come and gives many, many details. It's a, it's a teaching book. Uh, you know, Matthew had been, as you know, a tax collector. His name was also Levi. He was uh, kind of despised, uh, but he got saved, became a follower of Christ, and because of his job was a man with a brilliant mind and given to a lot of detail. And so, as I've said, his book is supremely a teaching book or a teaching gospel. Now, he is writing to a Jewish mind and a Jewish culture, trying to convince them that this Jesus of Nazareth, who admittedly was uh, killed as a criminal, nevertheless, he was the real Messiah. It was a tremendous job, of course, to be able to convince people. And the Jewish mind would not even consider, I mean, wouldn't even consider listening to somebody claiming to be a Messiah or somebody on their behalf unless their genealogy could be traced back to David. That was the big deal. Now, when John opens his gospel, and we've been looking at it for a few weeks, he said, in the beginning was the Word. There's no genealogy because the Greek mind was different, and it was that Greek mind was not expecting a Messiah. But the Jewish mind talked to them about a coming Messiah or a Messiah who has come, and they want to know about his genealogy. Is there proof of the genealogy? And so that's why at the beginning of Matthew, even though it may seem a little boring or dry to most people, it's actually very interesting, all these begats, this one begat that one, and that one begat the other one, right down the line, so that Matthew actually covers 42 generations. Now, he breaks these 42 generations down into three groups of 14 each. And in fact, if you read Matthew chapter 1, I hope you have it open there, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 17. Now get your thinking cap on. So all the generations from Abraham to David, down to David, are 14 generations, and from David until the exile, carrying away into Babylon, 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon, the exile, on down to Christ, were 14 generations. Now, actually there were more, but there were 14 each that he was highlighting to prove a point, to prove that our God is Pandocrator, the God who is in control on the stage of history in spite of all contradictory circumstances, to prove to us that if we trust him, he's in control of our lives. You don't need to go to pieces. Uh, you don't need to be a nervous wreck. No matter what's happening, trust God. He's going to bring you through. The Bible says all things work together for good. The Greek has it that God enters into all things. He enters into the mix in order to eventually produce good for us, for 
for his glory. So Matthew is convincing a Jewish mind of the fact that this Jesus, in spite of the fact that he was crucified as a criminal, he was, to put it in modern parlance, he was the real McCoy, he was the true Messiah, and that his lineage could be traced back not only to David, but all the way back to Abraham. Now Luke does uh, uh, something similar, and Matthew and Luke have these genealogies, one really to trace uh, to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and one to Joseph, the father, or the supposed father of Christ. Now there's some things very interesting here to show us how God, one more time, is in control on the stage of world history, and therefore in our lives, if we will trust him. Why do you think that he, uh, this is Matthew, categorized all these generations into 14 in each category, or 14 in each section? Well, you know, there is a thing called mnemonics. Have you ever heard of the word mnemonics? Mnemonics is a form of teaching whereby you uh, teach in such a way that you make it easy for the people to commit it to memory. And that's what he was doing. He was tracing things back to David because the Jews were so proud of David, the Messiah to come would have to be the son of David. But see, David in numericals is equal to 14. I suppose that you're aware that in Hebrew there really are no uh, uh, figures, just letters, but the letters have a numerical value. In Hebrew uh, there are no written vowels. So that David is actually DWD, which is 14. So he thought, uh, no doubt, this would be a good way, using mnemonics, uh, that he could have 14, which stood for David, 14 and 14, in order for the people to be able to commit it to memory, because in those days you couldn't go into the local bookstore and buy a book that had just been printed. It was a big, it was a big item uh, to keep these uh, uh, details and to keep uh, this, this history and to keep all these records. And so Matthew, as I've said, is uh, seeking to reach this Jewish mind by making it clear that he can prove in this easy to memorize way, 314, 14 stands for David, as I've said. He used that as the key because David was the big deal to the Jewish mind. They wanted it all the way back to Abraham, but particularly that branch which went through David of the Israeli people. So that's why we have all these baguettes, to prove the point, because if you cannot prove that uh, it goes back to uh, David, then don't even talk to me about your Messiah. It just doesn't work. Now, there's always a handful of people who follow some false Messiah without checking that out. But uh, the Jewish race as a whole would not do that back there uh, because they knew about the importance of the genealogy. That's why Matthew sets it out that way. However, it is absolutely staggering what is involved in all these begets. In fact, you're going to be amazed as we get into this Bible study today. So here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to be sure now, make sure the phone's off the hook, make sure the door is closed, make sure you got your thinking cap on, and with this little, you know, preview, uh, you're now ready for this uh, message. The Jewish people, the Israeli people, in the Old Testament were raised with this thought in mind. A Messiah was coming, and he was going to be of the seed of David. Why? Well, not just because David was their hero. If you go to Mount Zion today, just beside Jerusalem, or to the tomb of David, you can still see evidence that uh, he's a hero to these people, these wonderful people. But it wasn't only because of uh, the fact David was their hero. It was because God had said that's the way it's going to be. And so it would have to be from David. You know, uh, uh, Paul talks about this. Peter talks about this. Let me give you an idea. For example, in Acts chapter 2, verse 29, there's more than this, but just to give you an idea, Acts 2, 29, um, Peter speaking the day of Pentecost, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. 
Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, in Jesus' fleshly body, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. And then in verse uh, 34, uh, For David is not ascended unto the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou in my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus of the seed of David, whom ye have crucified, uh, both Lord and Christ. So Peter was heavy into that. Let me tell you about uh, Paul in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1 and uh, verse uh, 3. Here is what uh, Paul says. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Uh, there's another one over here, Second Timothy. Let me see if I can grab it quickly. Second Timothy 2 and verse uh, 8. Where is that? Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised uh, from the dead according to my gospel. But then perhaps the most significant one of all, away at the end of all things in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. What does our Lord Jesus do himself? I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. In other words, I am the fulfiller of Scripture. I am the fulfiller of dreams. I am the one who is, we would say again, the real McCoy. Now remember the three categories that Matthew put all this into. The first one, uh, the, uh, the three, uh, each with 14 generations, a total of 42. Uh, the first one was down to uh, David, then down to the exile, and then on down to our Lord Jesus Christ. But in itself, those three as one is like a microcosm of the gospel because the first one speaks of a wonderful dream. The second category, ending, you know, in the exile, speaks of that dream smashed. But then when you get down to Christ, he is the restorer of the dream. He is the fulfiller of the dream, Amen. not only in the stage of world history, but in our lives. Um, you remember Milton, the poet, he talked about paradise lost and paradise regained. God had his hand, as I have said, on all these things. So, Matthew goes ahead and proves the point that what happened, and this of course was at least a thousand years before Matthew when the promise was given to David and the Israeli people all believed it, that when the Messiah would come, he would be of the seed of David. Therefore, he proves it too, tracing it all the way back. For example, in chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the generation, the book of the genealogy, of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's going backwards through David to Abraham. So Christ was to come of the seed of Abraham, but after Abraham, his seed was multiplied, but it was through that Davidic branch that the Messiah was going to come. And so then he goes on down, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and so forth and so on, all the way down. But here is the amazing thing. In this list, which one more time, using mnemonics, he uh, made it easier for them using the, the, the number 14, referring to David, in those three uh, ca categories. Just wanted to say that uh, one more time, or three sections. However, in this uh, list of all these uh, generations, he includes four women. And actually, he ends up with Mary, the mother of our Lord in the New Testament, and I guess then that would really be a total of five. But particularly the, these first four women who are named in these generations, that is staggering, because women normally in those days, sad to say, were treated like chattel and would never appear in this list. And you have to say to yourself, what's Matthew doing, including these people, what he's trying to convince somebody of the purity and the directness of the line all the way back, back to David. But he does more than that. Let me tell you what he chooses these women. 
uh, Tamar and Rahab and Bathsheba and Ruth. He, he does more uh, than talk about women per se. If he had have ransacked the Old Testament, he could not have come up with four women who were more questionable than these four. I mean, how in the world can they get into the lineage of Jesus, the pure Son of God? How can they be part of the line? You know, generations were born, people run about doing their business, but all the time God's got his hand on everything, showing his control that he can do what he wants to do, what he will do, eventually on the stage of history. But I mean, for a start, two of these women uh, were Gentiles. Uh, Rahab and Ruth. They were Gentiles. Uh, do you know that Tamar was a prostitute, uh, a harlot? Uh, do you know that uh, Rahab was a prostitute? You know that Ruth was not only a foreigner, beautiful soul was Ruth, but she was a foreigner. In fact, worse than that, she was of the land of Moab, and there were special commandments in the Old Testament against people of Moab participating in the temple of the Lord. Anything to do with anything in the service of the Lord. And have you ever heard of Bathsheba in her nakedness on top of that roof that very night committing adultery with David and then being in on the idea to get her husband murdered? We're talking about foreigners, at least one involved in murder of these four women, and prostitutes. I, I want to say it again. If Matthew had have ransacked the Old Testament, he could not have come up with more, unque more questionable, more questionable uh, women than these. So what's going on? Well, of course, the whole thing has to do with really what is a Greek word, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. Now, the Greeks don't say it like that. They drop the C and they say charis. And charis, or we English speakers, we would say charis. That's where we get our word charisma from, or even the word charismatic comes from that. What does charis mean? It's the word for grace. What is grace? It's unmerited favor, but it is such a strong word for unmerited favor that if you can pay even one penny toward it, it's no longer charis. It has to be totally and completely a gift, not based on your performance, but based on God's performance. Not because you're good, but because He's good. So God is showing that he has got the supreme ability to perform his word even when he's dealing with broken, fallen, inadequate humanity. People who have got a past that they were embarrassed about, but God not only forgive them, but use them, and they were actually in the line that produced Christ. So you have got to get the message. If the devil has been telling you that you have blown it, that you've made decisions which have wrecked your life, that you can never be used of God to produce Christ in this new sense that we would mean, bringing Christ to people, that you can never fulfill God's call upon your life. That is a flat-out lie. God has this capability. He doesn't produce bad, but He sure has this ability to take bad and to bring good out of it. In fact, it's a magnificent ability that God has. And Matthew in proving that the genealogy of Christ all the way back to David and the fulfillment of Scripture and all the way back to Abraham as well, includes these four women. In fact, he ends up by telling about Mary. You know, Mary, hey, to us, Mary is the mother of our Lord, and uh, she is pure and beautiful and wonderful. But do you know, to the folks back there, she was a 16-year-old girl, approximately 16, who was pregnant out of wedlock. I mean, to, to the natural mind looking at these five women, God could not have come up with worse, N looking at it naturally. In some ways, I hate to include Mary in that, but I'm talking about how she was looked upon, not what she was. But you know what the Bible says? 
that God, uh, you know, he can take the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. Not many great, not many noble are called. It is the ordinary, even weak people who have sense enough after they have fallen to get up, face the right direction, dust themselves off, ask for forgiveness, and refuse to budge from this belief that in spite of our past, God can still use us to produce Christ. Think, for example, of Tamar. What a story! You remember the famous Judah? Yes, the same Judah that Jesus was later called. He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's where we get the word Jew from. It's a contraction of Judah. Well, you remember the famous Judah? What did he do? Well, his son, you know, uh, was married to, 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 to Tamar, and he's, he's killed. And so the next son is supposed to marry her, Onan. He refuses to perform as a husband. The Bible puts it rather bluntly. It says that he let his seed, semen is the word, you might as well know it, fall to the ground. That's the way the Bible says He refused to do it. So uh, then she wanted the, according to the Levitical law, she wanted the third son to be her husband. Judah drew back, said, well, you'll get him later. She believed he really wasn't meaning it. So what did she do? Well, she just just uh, became a harlot. That was it. Covered up her face, went out there. And who did she meet as one of her first clients, or the client? Judah, her father-in-law. He didn't know her. She had a veil over her face. They had a sexual union, the Bible. Hey, the Bible does not cover up anything. You talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and yet God weaves his pattern through it all. Don't give up just because some things have been ugly in your life. She goes out there, they have this sexual union, but before they do, uh, she says, what am I getting for my services? You know I'm paraphrasing, but this is exactly what it is. And he said, well, I'm going to give you such and such. Well, she said, I want a surety. I want a, gar a guarantee for it. So he has kind of like a little thing around his neck. And he gives her that in his staff, and uh, she's going to take that away, and then she can cash it in when she gets uh, the reward later. Well, away she goes. He doesn't know who it was. Just to him, it was the satisfaction of a sexual a desire. Well, then she's fine to be pregnant. So Judah calls her in three months later, and Judah calls her in, and he's going to lay it on her for her punishment. And she said, just before you say anything else, and what she do? She produces the little locket thing, whatever it was, uh, from a, his seal from around his neck, and his staff, which she had taken as surety. Well, <laughs> the old boy was caught, and he was caught in absolute amazement. And to his credit, he said, she is more righteous than I am. But she was pregnant with twins out of that ugly, illicit relationship with her father-in-law. You talk about dirty stuff. I mean, this borders on pornography. God's not behind it, but God has this ability to bring good out of bad. Why? Because one of those twins was Perez, P-E-R-E-Z. And you can read these begats and find where Perez is, because Perez, even though it was way back there, way back there, Perez is, the, is in the line that's directly to Jesus Christ. How does God do it? Does it not look like a sordid line? Well, the line goes back to David and back to Abraham. That's the thing that Matthew was trying to say. But he was also not covering up the fact that there were inadequate people, broken people, sinful people, and yet God, in spite of everything, still is in control and still can perform his word in spite of what man does and how man blows it. Now, you've got to see this and got to understand it because it's very powerful. God's in control, but he's in control in your life. Now, you may have been worse than Tamar, or maybe not nearly as bad, but you feel you're blowing it. Well, out of her womb came Perez. There, was, there were twins, but Perez, one of them, and he's in the line. Amazing. What about Rahab? Well, you know, the 40 years were over. This is a different story. The 40 years are over in the wilderness. And uh, the children of Israel, under the leadership of Joshua, they're encamped at Shittim, a place called Shittim. Uh, in the plains of Moab, they're about to go over across the Jordan and take the first fortified city in the land of Canaan, Jericho. So he sends two spies. Don't mix them up with the other 12 for, who are more famous. 
and he says spy out and see especially you know the situation. Now they ended up in uh, Rahab the harlot's house. Uh, we're not given any details there, but you wonder to yourself, why were they there? There were men coming and going all the time, and somebody squealed, leaked the news, had got up to the king of Jericho. He sent word down to Rahab and said, bring them out. And she said, they're not, they're not nobody here at all. Not. She had them hid upstairs under stalks of flax. Uh, the soldiers bought her story, and they left, and then she gave them instructions, the two Israeli spies. Hide in the hills for three days and then get back there. But, she says, I've done this on your promise that when you invade this, I've heard what the Lord has done for Israel, and you invade this city and this country, that you'll spare me and all my family. She lets them out on a rope down the wall because her house was on the wall, and they said to her, we will spare you. But what you've got to do is let out a uh, scarlet, a scarlet thread, a scarlet cord, speaking of the blood of Christ. And when we see that, our soldiers will not kill you. And it's, it's what happened. They were all saved. And the Bible says at that point they were still living in Israel to that day. A foreigner, a liar, and a whore. Not putting her down, I'm telling you like it is. A foreigner, a liar, an adulterer, a whore, a prostitute, and a Gentile. Read Matthew chapter 1. Her name is actually mentioned. She's there quoted by Matthew when he's boasting about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Absolutely staggering and absolutely amazing. Let's take a breather for just a second, as it were. What is this all about? Well, first of all, when the Bible gives us these genealogies, they mean something. And if we have time on subsequent telecasts, we'll go into this even more. And you'll be amazed at these names and, and uh, what happened in the, the fulfillment of the genealogies right down to and through Christ. Luke gives it also, I said earlier, one is for the lineage of uh, Mary, the other for Joseph, but back both of them go right all the way to David. One more time, remember that it was God that said it would happen that way, and back to Abraham too, and yet it looked like, because of sinful men and women, that the whole plan was botched up and messed up, and yet God was able to do repair work. He was able to maneuver the pieces, and when people were going about their ordinary lives and had no idea that there was a purpose to anything, God was working it all out so that when Christ did arrive, true enough, he would be directly from Abraham through the Davidic branch or through the David line, as we would say. What does it all teach us? It teaches us that God is in control. And if you trust him, don't try to be perfect. He knows you're not. Trust him. Trust him regarding your family, your health, your business tomorrow. Commit your way into the hands of the Lord. He shall bring it to pass. He's a magnificent God who's not demanding perfection. He's demanding trust. You can rest in the knowledge that he shall direct thy paths as you trust him. And even if you've blown it, and things are messed up, and you give him a can of a mess, well, he's about the only one that can put Humpty Dumpty together again. He can on scramble eggs. He's a terrific God. He will lead you by the hand and lead you to the promised land. But there's more. Oh, is there ever more? Rahab and Ruth were Gentiles. How did they get mixed up in it? One more time, it's listed here deliberately by Matthew, not only to prove the genealogy back to David and Abraham, but to show that in spite of the devil and human inadequacy, when God is committed to his word, his word is going to be fulfilled. You know, Paul talks to, to, to Timothy, even if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny his word. It's too big a subject almost. It's incredible. Trust him, trust him, trust him. And he can put Humpty Dumpty together again, somewhere or other. The Bible proves it. Remember one more time those three sections of 14 each? 
Uh, down to David, the dream. Down to the exile, the dream destroyed. Down to Christ, he's the restorer of the dream, even though he didn't have much to work on. Remember <coughs> Ruth. Ruth is a beautiful story. The story of Ruth and the kinsman redeemer is one of the most beautiful in the Bible. But she's a foreigner and belonging to Moab, she was ruled out. But the grace of God, haris, unmerited favor, reaches out to you. It's not because of your goodness. It's in spite of your failures that God loves you and that he can use you. Uh, there was a lady in the uh, Bethlehem area called Naomi. Her husband was Elimelech, two sons, Malon and Chilion. There's a famine in the land. They go to Moab, which of course it looks like they shouldn't have done, enemy territory. But they go to Moab because they're starving. Within 10 years, when you hear this, by the way, the two sons, Malon and Chilion, they married two Moabite girls, Orpah and Ruth. Within 10 years, the three men were dead, father and both sons, Elimelech, Malon, and Chilion. They're dead. So now we have three widows, Naomi, mother-in-law, and Orpah and Ruth. She said, I've heard that there's uh, food aplenty at Bethlehem, my home place. Naomi said, I'm going back. The two girls said, well, we want to go with you, but Orpah was quickly convinced that she should go back to her own family. She did that. So Orpah's out of the picture. But Ruth, the Moabite girl, she's different. Uh, she says to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Where you dwell, I will dwell. Your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. Naomi did everything to send her back, but she wouldn't do it. She came forward, went to Israel. When she was there, oh, I've no time. The story is so beautiful. Remember the story of Boaz and the kinsman redeemer and so forth and so on? Well, she finally gets married to this wealthy fellow, Boaz, who was the, the kinsman redeemer. And of course, they have a child, and, another, and then that child is a child, and it goes down from Obed, and it goes through Jesse, and out of Jesse, David is born. So Ruth is the great-grandmother of David, of King David, the very same David we're talking about. But wait a minute, how can it be? She's a Gentile. She's from Moab. It looks like to the Jewish mind she was ruled out. But Matthew was proving that the genealogy is correct. That was the first thing. He is, Christ is, of the seed of David through on the way, all the way back to Abraham, but also he is proving that God fulfills his word in spite of the inadequacy and the downright sin of broken humanity. And in the instance of Ruth, it's not sin per se, but the idea that she was Gentile and a Moabite ass would seemingly have ruled her out but such is Caris, such are the purposes of God. He is uh, so far above us as the heavens are above the earth. So are God's thoughts and God's ways above ours. You've got to learn to trust him. You've got to learn to trust him. You know, some people just want to preach about a woman wearing makeup or a hat in church or no hat in church. They get off on the side issues of legalism. God wants you to trust him because he is in control for those that trust him, pandocrator, coming from the Lord of hosts in the Old Testament through the Septuagint. The Lord of hosts, you can't get a higher title for God, the God who has got adequate supply. If you need six, he's got at least seven. He's got seven million, really. He's got everything. Pandocrator, the God that's in control. King David one night couldn't sleep. So he gets up and he paces back and forward on the roof. That's the way they built those flat roofs in those days. Paces back and forward in the evening. And there he looks over and he can't believe his eyes. This most strikingly beautiful young woman is on the roof of her house with an eye shot. And she's naked, bathing. Well, David's a red-blooded man. And he's just stirred with his passion. Now, people have said it was David's fault, and it was. Uh, the question arises, did she not know what she was doing? We'll just bypass that. 
because I don't know. But it looks kind of fishy, the whole thing. What I do know is, that night, he sent for her, brought her in secretly, had a sexual relationship that night, and then went further than that. Her name was Bathsheba, you know her name. Then they had to conspire in order to cover up the sin to get Uriah, her husband, who was out at the battlefront, out on the battlefield, uh, to bring him back uh, for some reason, and they came up with a reason so that he could be with his wife, and then they could always say, well, it was her uh, 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 son. But he kind of, in David's eyes, he was kind of dumb because although he came back, he said, how could I go in and sleep with my wife, have that luxury and that pleasure when there's soldiers on the field who cannot do that, so he didn't sleep with her when he was home. So that ruined David's story. So the next thing was, he sent word that he would be put to the head of the battle, the battlefront, to be killed, and he was killed. What's this Bathsheba up to? I mean, I'm blaming David. But believe me, I am. Uh, but uh, she, talking about the woman at this time, this is what this message is about, because she's named here. She is in on the adultery. She's an adulteress, but apart from that, she's in on this murder, at least to some degree. And then when it's over, and the time of mourning's over, why, what'd she do? Well, you know, she marries David, and they have a baby. The baby dies. But she has another baby not too long afterward. <laughs> His name is Solomon. And Solomon is directly in the line of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, how can God unscramble eggs? How can he take that ugly, messy, pornographic story of lust, illicit sex, sin, and all the way up to murder, and it was in high places that involved the king? I mean, this was big news. How can God take that mess and still produce his end result? Uh, does it mean that he caused those things to happen? Don't you ever believe it? God does not do bad. And let me tell you, God doesn't do evil, and he doesn't tempt us with evil. God tests us. It's the devil that tempts us. No, it's God's ability, as I've said five or six times, to, to bring good out of bad. And David was a good man. And David loved God. He sure blew it then. But God knew his heart. He called upon God. Read Psalm 51, where he broke his heart over what had happened. Got back into relationship with God. And even after that, even after the ugliness of that, you know what God called him? A man after my own heart, after that sin. God's amazing ability to weave things. Now, in my own little humble life, I look back, you know, on things that at the time seemed to have no significance. Certain people crossing your path, for example. I'm going back a number of years and certain moves we made. And yet looking back on it, God was in control the whole way. The Bible says he led him about. Now, we, we all want to be led. We don't want to be led about. But let God lead you, and he'll bring you to that desired haven where you are what he wants you to be. And you can produce Christ, <clears throat> be a blessing to people, and fulfill the purpose for which you were born. God's ability, Pando Crater, the God who's in control in spite of all contradictory circumstances. And whether you're talking about a Bathsheba, a Tamar, a Rahab, a Ruth, God takes these people with everything stacked against them and includes them as part of the genealogy of Christ to show that God fulfills his word even through inadequate people. I read for you again Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of the generation, the proof of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He really is the Messiah in spite of everything, in spite of the fact that he was crucified as a criminal. He is the son of David. He is the son of Abraham. Now, we would say this great, great, great son, grandson or something, but in those days, they could skip generations and say the son, just simply meaning it was in the same line. And Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judas and his brethren, and Judas begot Perez and Zara, etc., uh, etc. Et On it goes. But I want to get to verse 17. I read it to you before. So, no, verse 16. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. 
42 generations. And Christ was in the lineage of David. It, he has been called Great David's Greater Son. Hail to the Lord's anointed, Great David's Greater Son. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. Mnemonics, this is an easy way to remember it. Down to David, 14. Down to the exile, the carrying away into Babylon, 14. Down to Christ, 14. This is a microcosm of the gospel. God weaving his purposes on the stage of history. The dream coming down to David of what could have been. Down to the exile, the dream smashed. Down to Christ, in spite of the inadequacy and the failure of the lineage, Christ comes as the restorer of the dream, as the repairer of the breach, and to fulfill for jury what was supposed to be. I look into your eyes, as it were, through this camera, and I say to you, now, now, now whatever you do, don't quit. Don't you be doing anything foolish. Don't get a gun or jump over a bridge or do something stupid. You've only got one life. And to repeat what I've already said twice, God can do something with Humpty Dumpty. I don't know how he does it, but you'll see him starting to work as long as you repent, ask him to forgive you, to come into your heart, to dominate your life, and you start to trust him. He will fulfill his purposes. You will fulfill the call of God upon your life, and you will help to produce Christ in spite of the fact that you may have blown it big time. I urge you, I urge you, don't quit. Don't give up. As the little hymn used to say that we sang in Ireland, come to the Savior and make no delay. God's ability to put everything together again is astounding, and he can do it and we'll do it for you. Now, be sure to let me know if you've enjoyed today's telecast. Write to me or give me a call and say that you got something from it. And by His grace and with your prayers, we will continue coming your way with no other agenda other than to fulfill God's purposes and bring His Word to you. Don't quit. Don't give up. Pando Crator. Your God is in control. Tell others about the telecast. See you next week.